You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 139, The Soviet Union, Part 9, The Military Purges. This week, a big thank you goes out to TK, D-Man, Tim, Chuck, James, Mike, Bella, Vladimir, Zach, and Rob for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. I would also like to thank Vladimir for the donation. Last episode covered some of the events that led to the Great Purge, a series of arrests that would sweep through the Soviet Union from 1937 to 1938. While the wider purge was occurring throughout society, there was also a focused purge occurring of the Red Army, particularly among its officers. This would be a critical event because it would see thousands of Red Army officers, up to and including Marshal Tukhachevsky, hero of the Civil War and head of the Red Army for much of the interwar period, removed from their position. The result of the leadership purges was that the structure of the Red Army was gutted. This would have a very negative impact on any military in the world. Experienced officers are a precious commodity that are quite hard to replace. But it was particularly challenging for the Red Army to recover because of the massive expansion that it would go through in the following years. Even before the purges, the Red Army was having trouble finding enough officers and training up enough officers to keep up with its need to grow in size. And removing thousands of the existing officers did not help the situation at all. These actions are even more perplexing due to the strong belief among Soviet leadership, including Stalin, that war could be just around the corner, and that the threat of attack from other nations in Europe or from Japan was more likely than ever before. So the question is kind of a simple one. Why did this happen? As with the other purges, the threat from the army was discussed as a threat to the entire Soviet Union, with the concern being that there was a plot within the army to launch a coup, fueled by counter-revolutionary, maybe even fascist, infiltration of the highest ranks of the Red Army. When the information was brought to Stalin, he believed that the only path forward was to do what had already been done to perceived political threats in the past, and that meant a purge. In practice, it would not look greatly different from the political purges. There was a wave of arrests of those closely associated to the source, in this case Tukhachevsky, and then there was a wave of denunciation among the officer corps as various individuals claimed others were involved in the plot. Once that happened, the arrests sort of grew to an incredible number, and a simple leadership purge became the Great Purge. There was just one problem. There's no evidence any kind of conspiracy among the military leadership to do anything like what they were suspected or accused of doing. At the time, there was a claim that there was proof, of course, but nothing has ever been found, even after the Soviet archives were opened to full research in the 1990s. It was all a lie, a fabrication, but the results were very real. This episode will look at the relationship between the Red Army and the political leaders of the Soviet Union, the actions taken as part of the purges, and the consequences for the Red Army and for the Soviet Union, when, in 1941, the Red Army would be faced with its greatest challenge, and it really needed, like, experienced officers to help out with that. During the revolution, the Red Army had been created as a workers' army, and over the course of the revolution and the Civil War, this would change. The hard truth was that to be at its most efficient, the Red Army could not be a revolutionary army, but had to instead adopt many of the structures of the old Tsarist army that it had replaced. Professional officers, hierarchy, structure were all reintroduced throughout the Civil War to answer the threats posed by the Whites and their allies. 
The army that was defeated at the gates of Warsaw was closer to the structure of the Russian army of 1916 than the Revolutionary Army of 1917. This continued during the 1920s and 30s, and men like Tukhachevsky pushed the Red Army forward into a new age of modernization and mechanization powered by the industrialization of the five-year plan. But there had always been some tension between the party leaders and the leaders of the army, with the very real concern that the Red Army had the structure and the power to overthrow the Soviet leaders if they really wanted to. In theory, the way to fix this was to make the army impotent, but it was still important that the army was kept strong due to the threats posed by external powers. It made for a difficult balancing act. One of the ways that this was balanced was through the use of the NKVD, which had its own military units that numbered around 150,000 men in 1936. These were not combat troops, though, and instead were used as behind-the-lines logistical, communication, and transportation troops. This allowed them to exercise some control, while also not requiring them to be structured like combat units. Tukhachevsky was also not a close associate of Stalin, and certainly did not owe his position to Stalin's patronage. But the idea that the Red Army leadership posed a threat would never be fully extinguished during this period, regardless of Stalin's relationship with Tukhachevsky. And as the overall threat level was amplified by the political purges and the, the rhetoric around those political purges, the military would drift into the spotlight. The purges of the late 1930s would also not be the only purges of the military, or the first. And in fact, there had been several smaller instances of mass arrests and repressions within the army earlier during the 1930s. These events in the earlier years were often focused around a specific event or a very specific group of individuals. For example, with so many soldiers coming from the poor rural families that had been, uh, there had been some protests among lower ranked soldiers around the collectivization efforts, because it was collectivization that was happening where, where they grew up and where they lived before they joined the army. And these protests had resulted in a wave of arrests. But all of the earlier instances of military purges had paled in comparison to what would happen during 1937. Those purges were rooted in fears that there was a conspiracy brewing. This included rumors and reports that the Red Army was working directly with the Germans to undermine Stalin and the Communist Party. This connection between the Red Army leaders and Germany included, allegedly, that there were meetings between the two parties. These rumors were confirmed when Pravda's Berlin correspondent sent a letter to Lev Miklas, one of the Pravda's editors, with information about the links between the Germans and the highest military officers, with Tukhachevsky named specifically. While these rumors circulated, they fed upon the pre-existing feelings of fear and doubt that had fueled the other purges, along with some of the unique features of the Red Army. Within the Army High Command, there were many officers whose tenure dated back to the Civil War years. As with any military, these officers, the higher-ranked ones, often had served in the military for a good portion of their lives, some from even before the Revolution. But in the Red Army of 1937, these long tenures meant that their period of command overlapped back to the days when even Trotsky was leading the Red Army in the years immediately after the Civil War. This connection with Trotsky would tie many officers directly into the Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev counter-revolutionary plot that had been so important as part of the reason for Zinoviev's and Kamenev's execution. With the German connection seemingly confirmed and the known connection to Trotsky, the military purges would begin. There are two things that seem clear about the causes for the purges. The first is that there is not great evidence that there was any real connection between the Red Army High Command and the Germans, at least in terms of working together to overthrow Stalin. They had worked together during the interwar period at various times in various activities. There is some evidence that the entire thing was another set of fabricated documents by the NKVD as an excuse for the military purges, and really there might be more evidence for that than for direct collaboration with the Germans. The second is that the military purges that would follow were not some kind of long, thought-out plan, but instead were a sort of set of decisions made based on an immediate threat that it was felt the military leaders posed. There's not some kind of carefully thought out and executed series of events for the military purges, but instead it simply kicked off and kind of went and it kind of became a beast of its own. This is one of those instances where I also want to mention that the sources are all over the place in terms of why the military purges happened or why they developed the way that they did. 
you can find well-researched sources that clearly cast the purges as a simple overreaction to a rumor. Other sources claim that it was a fully fabricated set of events. The evidence was fabricated by Stalin and the NKVD specifically to use it as an excuse to get rid of the military officers. There are articles as recent as 2015 that discuss the causes of the purges and whether or not Stalin was just reacting to events or was causing those events directly. I do not, I want to make that clear, have a firm answer for you either way. It's certainly possible that this was all a setup, but it's also possible that it's another situation where Stalin and the NKVD took an event, the existence of these rumors, and quickly and expertly capitalized on it to achieve their goals. I'm inclined towards the belief that events were driven by a real fear of a conspiracy in the military, which Stalin greatly overreacted to. But again, that's, that's really very much an opinion. What cannot be argued is that the overreaction served him in his goal of maintaining his control and of gaining greater control over the Red Army and making sure that people that were loyal to him were the people in the right places within that army. Probably the last group within the Soviet Union that posed any real threat to Stalin was the Red Army, and this was the instance where he would, for lack of a better term, take care of that problem. Regardless of the cause, though, the result was a massive wave of arrests. The massive purge of the military would not just happen immediately, though. It would kind of slowly build up over time. In March 1936, uh, Marshal Voroshilov would make a speech in which he would claim that a large Trotsky and fascist conspiracy was taking place in the Soviet Union, and that the military had to remain ever vigilant about the effects of this conspiracy on the military itself. He would also claim that the conspiracy had already infiltrated some areas of the Red Army, and that those elements had to be purged if the Red Army was to remain true to the revolution. He called for actions, quote, to sweep out with an iron broom, not only all this scum, but everything that recalls such an abomination. It is necessary to purge the army literally up to the very last crack. The army should be clean. The army should be healthy, end quote. Along with actions from the top, Voroshilov also asked every member of the military to remain vigilant, which would also be a crucial component of the wider Great Terror. He would say, quote, They think that the center should know everything, see everything. No, the center does not see everything, nothing of the sort. The center sees only part, the rest is seen by the localities. It sends people, but it does not know these people 100%. You should check them. This is one way to test this. It is the checking people at work according to the results of their work, end quote. Voroshilov would then set out a plan of action to combat this conspiracy, including wide-ranging investigations of the pasts of all officers, particularly those that had access to secret documents. A new level of scrutiny would also be placed on any accidents that should occur to root out any possible acts of sabotage that were happening. In the first days of June, Yezhov would present some evidence in the form of a report to the Military Soviet of the Defense Commissariat, Yezhov being the head of the NKVD at this moment. The report would say, and would lay out the evidence, that the Red Army had turned into a counter-revolutionary organization, and that there were many within the ranks of the Red Army that had been, or were actively, conspiring against the Soviet leaders. Cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. A few days later, on June 9th, several high-ranking officers, including Tukhachevsky, were relieved of their commands, and shortly thereafter, they would be arrested. 
At least in the beginning, these arrests did not spiral out to the entire army, but were instead focused on, a, on high-ranking officers with clear ties to men like Tukhachevsky or Trotsky or Zinoviev or Kamenev, or maybe they were old czarist officers, or they had connections to the, to the whites from the Civil War period. That was the kind of group that was initially targeted in these arrests. But very soon after, the group would massively expand. There is some evidence that, unlike in some other situations, Stalin was a bit more hesitant to sanction the arrest of some of the higher-ranking military officers. On the political side of the purges, the bar for what might get you arrested was, was real low. But especially for Tukhachevsky, greater evidence was requested before the next steps were taken. But a new set of evidence would eventually be obtained. This new set of arrests, or the arrests of, of the higher level officers, would be caused by the testimony of a brigade commander, Medvedev, who would be arrested in early May under the charge that he was connected to a counter-revolutionary group. He would claim that Tukhachevsky and many other high-ranking officers were active participants in an organization set up to take control of the Soviet Union. It's hard to know how serious we should take this testimony, given the known track record of the NKVD obtaining exactly the confessions they wanted out of people they arrested. But the end result would be Tukhachevsky's arrest. After being arrested, the confession from Tukhachevsky would be obtained on May 26th. Quote, I headed a counter-revolutionary military plot in which I fully acknowledge my guilt. The aim of the plot was to overthrow the existing government by force of arms and the restoration of of capitalism, end quote. He would go on to claim that the plotters were connected with the Zinoviev Kamenev bloc and their followers, and the goal was to seize power through a coup. Uh, they would seize power by causing revolts around the Soviet Union, that they hoped to sabotage the ability of the state to defend itself, that they had already been actively sabotaging the Soviet Union, and that they were working directly with senior German military leaders in their efforts. On May 29th, Tukhachevsky would say that he was actually a German spy. As with all interrogations and confessions during this time, the methods used to obtain this confession were forceful. And also, once the confession was obtained, by whatever means that it was, that sealed the guilt of the accused. Instead of a show trial, though, Tukhachevsky and many of the military officers would be sentenced to death in a private military trial, with Tukhachevsky being executed on June 14th, 1937. The confessions and executions of the officers would kick off a mass purge of the military, with the breadth of the accusations being much higher than in any of the previous wave of military arrests. It began with a new call for the military to bring any conspiracies into the light, and soon the purge spread through the ranks of the military like wildfire. There were denunciations happening all over the place as soldiers of all ranks were suddenly seeing hidden conspiracies and members of those conspiracies all around them. The military purges would continue alongside the wider purges until 1938. By the time that they were over, the highest ranks of the military had been cleaned out, with 3 out of 5 marshals, 13 of 15 army commanders, 57 out of 85 corps commanders, 110 out of 195 divisional commanders, and 220 out of 406 brigade commanders being purged. It was worse in some areas than others. For example, the Kiev military district was especially hard hit by the purges, with 90% of their corps commanders being purged, along with 84% of their divisional commanders. The total number of military officers that were purged was around 35,000, but that number seems a bit fuzzy. So many of the sources that you can find out there about the military purges cite numbers only in percentages for these purges, not in raw numbers, which makes it difficult to kind of determine what they were and compare between sources. As most historians are far more focused on the impact that the purges had on the Soviet military between 1938 and 1941 instead of just numbers. And that impact was important. The officers that were purged from the Red Army during the Great Terror were many of the foundational pieces of the Red Army that had helped to build the army from its origins as a worker-led militia in 1918 to one of, if not the, most feared military in the world during the mid-1930s. They had defined what the Red Army was and how it planned to fight a war. That included not just strategy and tactics, but the design of equipment, tanks, aircraft. 
There were also many of the most experienced officers who were removed at a time when the Red Army was already struggling to find and train new officers as it continued to try and expand its numbers to match the threats that were being felt from external enemies. The purges of military leaders would have been hard enough for the Red Army to absorb under completely peaceful and normal circumstances, but the years between 1937 and 1941 were anything but normal. During these four years, there was a constant effort to expand the Red Army to meet the threats posed by rearmament efforts of those of other European nations, and then, you know, the war that was happening. The Soviet leaders felt that they had to match the military expansion of other nations, like Germany. But then the Red Army was then handicapped by suddenly losing thousands of officers, and especially experienced officers that were so almost impossible to replace. It would also have an effect on the officers that remained, something that we will dig into more next episode. But in summary, it would change how the leadership of the Red Army viewed the best way to fight a war, and change it in ways that would have really negative consequences in 1941. The Great Purges would end in November 1938. Even when it was over, though, Soviet society would be changed. In the political sphere, any and all opposition, or even those who were feared to possibly oppose the leading group within the Politburo, were removed. Throughout society, millions had been arrested, many sent to labor camps, some had been executed. In the military, the officer corps had been gutted, with thousands executed or, and even more arrested or removed from their positions. This kind of huge society-shaking event would have consequences. It would stick in the memories of those who had experienced it. And unfortunately, much like I mentioned a few episodes with the, the famines that would sweep the Soviet Union during the early 1930s, this would be just another event among many events as the nation moved closer towards what would be the greatest sort of struggle and the greatest catastrophe, which would be the war starting in 1941. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode in which we will talk about the Soviet military and how it planned to fight a war during the late 1930s.